staphylotoxin toxicity. Our body will excrete more homocysteine if we're exposed to mycotoxins because it helps us to stop the problem of mycotoxins. Funny enough, the vitamins that we take to lower homocysteine happen to have antifungal activity that's documented from laboratory reports. So does magnesium, by the way. They also inhibit the mutagenic activity of the mycotoxins. I don't want to say all mycotoxins, it's specific ones that I didn't document here. Um, and particularly aspergillus, which can infect you at low levels, can grow in the GI tract, can grow in the sinuses, and makes, uh, basically makes these mycotoxins. If you have high levels of homocysteine, it doesn't make the toxin. It actually, homocysteine will turn off that behavior in the mold. Let's look at diabetes. Well, one of the things that we said, that, that a scientist looked at is they said, you know, a group of people all got diabetes uh, at a very weird time in Finland, uh, all of them in October. And so they did this huge amount of research and said, well, well there's some nitrosamines in the meat that these people were eating, so maybe they cause it, but they could never get nitrosamines to cause diabetes in any animal studies ever. Well, it turns out nitrosamines are produced by fungus, but they're not the mycotoxin. So the researchers, this was in the 70s, um, they didn't have quite the same laboratory techniques they have now. The researchers actually showed, without knowing it, that there was a fungus present, but they didn't identify the compound because mycotoxins are bizarre molecules that are relatively small and relatively hard to detect. So we actually have a case there where eating cured meat caused diabetes, and there was pretty clear evidence that there were nitrosamines present, which means something was growing. We've also documented in animals that these mycotoxins are directly tied to diabetes. In other words, they've caused it in lab studies or it's been documented in animal husbandry. Down here, this is the name of a really ugly named mold. Uh, <laughs> very long, and I hope I typed it right. Uh, it makes this thing, which is also a drug we use, which is known to cause diabetes. So what I'm saying is there's enough evidence, not necessarily that all diabetes is caused by mycotoxins, but they're a contributing factor, and they hurt your pancreas, they hurt your kidneys. Uh, and some of them actually can be direct causes. Mice fed a diet, 10% of brewer's yeast get diabetes. Mm -hmm. That means beer, bread, bad, unfortunately, because I would love to have a bread and beer sandwich, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Let's talk about hormones. Estrogen is highly antifungal. People who study mycotoxins all know this. People who do hormones, for the most part, don't. Although I wouldn't be surprised if some of the hormone experts in this room knew about this. So I wonder if it's possible that our bodies excrete more estrogen when we're exposed to mycotoxins because they're antifungal. Let me tell you a story. When I weigh 300 pounds, I've got stretch marks. So I actually will show you one. It's right here. Woo. I'm a little puffy from the airplane flight, a little bit of jet fuel. But there's one right here. You only get those if you have too much estrogen. So we have pretty clear evidence that I had too much estrogen when I was a teenager because I got stretch marks from being fat. Funny enough, my wife, who just had our second child at 42, didn't get stretch marks. Her progesterone was where it needed to be. And actually, Dr. Miller ended up testing her levels of drugs, which we have documented. Um, and she had significant amounts of estrogen, but they were in balance. So we also know that people who are obese almost always have high estrogen levels. And we know that when you have more fat, that the fat actually makes more estrogen. Interesting. This would point out why that could be. Our bodies are not stupid. They don't do the things they do for random reasons or because they're poorly designed. They do it because we don't necessarily understand the basic things that are causing the behavior. We're designed to survive, and a lot of the things that I thought were just mistakes my body was doing were not. I was exposed to things I didn't know I was exposed to, and they were my body was basically reacting as best it biochemically could. Um, Zerelinone is one of my favorite mycotoxins. The reason for that is it's a hugely potent synthetic estrogen. There's a really cool product called uh, Zerenol. It's made for cattle ranchers. They take aspergillus, grow it in vats. In order to make any mold spit out more toxins, you basically torture it. So they grow it in these nice vats, and then they say, well, let's shake the vat a little bit, and then it makes more toxins. Let's heat it up a little bit, it makes more toxins. Let's expose it to microwaves. Let's expose it to radio waves, EMFs, anything they think of. Let's pour some acid in there. So they basically grew pissed off mold. <laughs> and it makes Zerelinone. 
One of the signs of being exposed to mycotoxins is seeing red dots move around. So if any of you see... <laughs> 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 uh, you can actually just point at things if they're useful. There might be one in here, too. Hey, what do you know? <laughs> Yours is better. <laughs> so, uh, they make this drug called Xeranol. It's a little waxy tablet. You go up to a cow, you stick it in the cow's ear. It melts. And the cow gets this nice kind of marbled texture, lots of fat in all the muscle, its proteins get all spongy and tender and delicious, if you don't know what real meat tastes like anyway. So one of the ways to make a cow fat and tender and worth more is the poison of xeralanone, to the point that we actually make xeralanone in labs to put in cows. Of course, this is something that goes into the fat in the animal, and then we eat it, and then we wonder why we don't get so good. Funny enough. There are many studies where they say, eat lean meat. Well, if the meat's been exposed to, to mycotoxins, which it probably has in our, you know, in our really mass-produced food world, yeah, if I go to a restaurant and I'm actually going to eat red meat, which I almost never do at restaurants because I just don't think it's that safe and I don't feel that well when I do it, I order the filet mignon because it's the leanest cut of beef they've got and it's still relatively tender. I would like to order the ribeye, that's what I eat at home. But the meat I have at home eats grass, doesn't have mold in it, and I feel fine when I eat it. In fact, I feel better when I eat the high-fat meat. This is why. Oops, going the wrong way. Hmm? Does uh, gluten-free bread have brewer's yeast in it? Excellent question. Does gluten-free bread have brewer's yeast in it? The answer is often, but not always. So you have to read the label. If it says yeast, it has yeast in it, and they are good about telling you if there's yeast in it. Um, as an example, one of the one of our one of the gluten-free breads, a rice-based bread that we liked, I did have yeast in it, and I said, you know, I, I don't want to be a perfectionist. So we eat the stuff every now and then, not every day. But we did a little experiment, we didn't eat it for a week, and we didn't give it to my daughter for a week. And she's already a little angel, I gotta say, and she's two and a half. Um, but the days when we give her the yeast bread, she's more hyperactive than the days when she doesn't. And she's not a hyperactive kid. She's uh, a phenomenal kid. But we notice that that's a variable of both Lana and me for how tired and just how good we feel. It's, and that's one piece of bread in the morning. Granted, we may, we may be more sensitive to the stuff because we don't eat it, because we both lived in a toxic mold house. But still, um, there is a reason to not eat yeast and you can avoid it. So, how many of you have heard of nice statin? Is it uh, one of the cholesterol-lowering drugs? No, nah, it's an antifungal. You take it for like athlete's foot and candida. Uh, it turns out it was the first statin drug, and researchers noticed, hey, these statins also lower cholesterol. Hey, let's make all the other statins. Every single statin drug out there that lowers cholesterol is an antifungal. Every single one of them. So how do they lower these? Uh, in fact, I don't think we quite know perfectly how they lower cholesterol levels. There's a bunch of theories, but um, as I understand it, none of them have been conclusively proven. If that's wrong, somebody say it. Well, here's a theory, pretty darn good one, I think, about why it works. Because when you lower the levels of fungus growing in the body, then your liver makes less cholesterol. Cholesterol protects you against the toxins in the mold. It makes sense, and there's massive research to show that it's true. Turns out, there's a definite link between fungus and cancer. Um, Cosentini has a book called uh, The Truth About Breast Cancer, linking another 900 or so studies to breast cancer. Funny enough, we talked about hormones, hormones, breast cancer, funguses, breast cancer, there are connections there. Um, but every one of the chemotherapy drugs um, that I've looked at, and all the ones that Cosentini and a couple other researchers have looked at, also are antifungals. There is, uh, also they've isolated in some cases um, fungal spores from actual tumors. I don't want to say every case of cancer is a fungus infection. I believe that some cases of cancer are either caused by mycotoxins or may actually have active fungus growing in them. That is uh, a personal statement. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that's the only way I'm not a cancer researcher. This is just based on my reading. So we talked about sex hormones, fungus affects those. Oh, your thyroid, slow thyroid. Funguses can affect thyroid function, it's well proven. Your pancreatic function, diabetes, kind of stuff. And we eat all these things. Uh, actually, I skipped a slide there. We talked about this a bit. Mycotoxins go into the animals, we eat them. Let's talk about what ranchers know. This was just incredibly eye-opening for me. Because 
people don't necessarily have a financial motive most of the time to make sure other people are healthy. And you could say some health insurers, and there's uh, a bunch of politics. In fact, uh, Dr. Miller has given a great talk about you know the future of healthcare, uh, which references some of the economic things going on here. But there's a different laboratory we can look at, and that is animal husbandry, ranching. These guys make money if their animals grow quickly, if they can have babies, if they're healthy. And if they have to spend money because they're sick, then they lose money. If they have a higher percentage of abortions, they lose money. So people who went to business school like me learned quite a while ago to start tracking stuff like that and looking for correlations because that's how you can make more money. Let's see what they learned. This is from a website for industry people who want to feed their cattle. This is how you tell if you have moldy feed. And there's major problems with mold. It's all over the place. Um, let's see, they look at, they eat less when there's mold in the food. They, they somehow know. They make less milk and it's lower quality milk. There's measurable aflatoxin M1, which is one of the metabolites of aflatoxin in the milk. Ovaries, or sorry, cysts on the ovaries. Stillbirths. Vaginal lacerations. Messed up estrus cycles and uh, some cows just stop having kids. They can control this by buying the cheap feed or the expensive feed. So being good business people who own the massive conglomerates, what are they gonna do? They're gonna lower the amount of toxin they feed the cows when they're pregnant, and as soon as they're done, they're gonna slaughter them, they feed them the cheap food that makes them fatter, even though they know they'll get sick, but they'll slaughter them before they're really all the way sick, and those toxins go into the cows. But it's cheaper and you make more money. It's like about pigs. Comanosin, which is one of the toxins that, uh, one of the, the species of mold that I have a particular allergy to, um, it causes acute lung edema in uh, pigs. It <coughs> sores in the mouth. How many of you have at some time in your life just had persistent sores on your lips or on your tongue that just don't go away? That's a yeast thing. That comes from fungus in your body or fungus in your diet. It's absolutely controllable. Vomitoxin, what they politely call feed rejection, it's what I call morning sickness. In fact, in the Better Baby book, I have a whole chapter on mycotoxins and how when you're pregnant, you should do what the ranchers do. Don't eat the moldy stuff. And I tell you what's the moldy stuff and what's not the moldy stuff. And knowing that you're still going to eat some moldy things, I'll tell you how to block it. And at the end of this presentation, I'll give you my cocktail that absorbs every mycotoxin possible, given what I know about all this stuff. Liver problems, intestinal hemorrhaging, um, prolapse. We are not so different than pigs. In fact, biochemically, we're pretty similar to them. Politically, we're actually very identical. <laughs> <laughs> the other things, uh, fungi, fung, fungi will do for you. Birth effects, miscarriages, those are topics of my book. Headaches. Headaches actually prevent pregnancy also, just in case you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Memory loss. Destruction of brain tissue. I was dealing with actually both of those, I believe, um, when I was exposed to a lot of mycotoxins, which was one of the reasons for my cognitive problems. The other one actually was that my blood was incredibly sticky, which is another side effect of mold exposure. So I clotted too easily. Cancer, allergies, hair loss, skin sores, rashes, hives, and chronic sinusitis, which I had for many years. Respiratory illnesses, bronchitis, lung problems. You, you kind of get the point. These things are not so good. And these are major contributors that we know do this. The problem is we don't know when they're in our food because there are some, uh, since the mid 80s, there are some policies for food. Most of them are around aflatoxin. But testing is relatively limited. And there's a whole series of these things, particularly the fumonacin toxins, we don't test for at all in the US. There aren't even regulations for them. There are in China and Brazil, but not here. They're bad for business. Asthma. Oh, I had that too. Three places where you, you can find these things. Moldy buildings, moldy bodies, and moldy food. It's relatively easy to take care of a moldy place. Before you move into a place, spend the three to 500 bucks to get an air test done. I recommend American air testing. Uh, John and Laura Riera were in the place. They did the air testing in uh, my kitchen when we had a really high level of um, aspergillus, no, penicillium. I'm blanking on which one was. It's an acillium raspberry. It's one of the two. Um, growing in our kitchen, um, something like 880 times the normal level um, was coming out from our dishwasher uh, from a leak we didn't know about. Um, and had profound health effects within a day when we pulled our dishwasher out. 
So they came in, they tested our air, and said, look what's in your air. And my wife, who happens to run Meliza Diagnostics, a company that can do testing for environmental contaminants, tested us and found, what do you know, huge immune response to these specific molds. So we actually showed we had health symptoms, we had the presence of the toxin in the air, and we had uh, an immune response to it, which is pretty interesting. I can tell you if I walk into a moldy place, I feel unwell. It's a, it's a sensation I get. I feel foggy. I just, I just don't feel good. I want to go to sleep. I want sugar and I want coffee and butter. So I can tell you when I went to rent a place a couple years ago, about a third of the places I walked into, I'm like, that room doesn't smell right. One of the places I signed a lease for, uh, at least a lease on in the Los Altos Hills, I said, yeah, I'm not quite sure about this. Hired the air testing guys to go in, and one of the rooms was absolutely full of all kinds of nasty stuff. Uh, if I had moved in there, I would have gotten slowly sick, my brain would have shut down, and I would have been listless, and I would have gained weight, and I would have felt generally crappy, and got all sorts of other infections. Would have figured out eventually, but I'm glad I dodged that bullet. Well worth doing if you're gonna move somewhere. Sometimes people don't have a problem at home. They have a problem when they go to the gym and work out. That swimming pool, that locker room, kind of smells stinky. It's not good for you. Schools in America are one of the biggest problems right now. You go into a typical public school, the odds of some of the classrooms having had roof leaks because of poor maintenance, it's extremely high. And it affects people. You can actually track absenteeism by room and predict which rooms are going to have problems. Sometimes air conditioning in your car can have that problem. It gets very moist in summer when you run it. Stuff condenses, mold can start growing, and then you blow spores in your face every time you drive. You may have no symptoms, you may have no problems, you don't need to go be an investigator, but if you have chronic health problems, this is a relatively cheap thing to do. Make sure your environment doesn't have this growing. If you have really nasty stuff like stachybotrys, the stuff that turns off stuff in your brain doesn't come back, uh, and I have some of that. Uh, I've managed to correct a lot of it, but my memory isn't what it once was. Um, the recommendation here is you leave anything porous behind, the spores spread out, and stachybotrys, each spore makes 300 other little tiny, basically chemical repository things, much smaller than spores, that are extremely toxic to people. So, what they did in our kitchen when we had this stuff, guys wearing spacesuits came in, literally Tyvek, positive pressure, they ripped everything out to the floorboards, scrubbed everything really, really well, HEPA vacuumed, HEPA cleaned the air for a long time, Came back a week later, tested to make sure the mold was gone, all the time wearing literally the same suits they were in clean rooms uh, to build semiconductors like the Intel guy. That's the level of toxicity of this stuff. What's wet dust? What's what? Did that say west? Oh, wet uh, dust. it says wet dust. So what they do is they take a wet cloth and wipe everything down. So if you know there's an area in your house that has mold, what you do is you basically dry clean everything, vacuum everything with a uh, vacuum that filters the particles. And anything you can't vacuum, you just take a wet cloth. My favorite uh, compound for this sort of thing is a mixture of vodka, which itself is a mycotoxin, but one that kills other molds. It uh, helps things to penetrate. And I mix it with grapefruit seed extract, which is a pretty strong antifungal. So the vodka helps to drive the GSE into spores so they don't come back. So if I see mold on something, I spray it with vodka and GSE, and I wipe it off, and it doesn't come back. So, you'll hear more about Jason in a little bit. It's pretty hard to clear mold out of your body. There's all kinds of people say, I don't take drugs. Uh, I don't take pharmaceutical drugs. I'll do this all natural. Uh, good luck with that. I tried that for a couple of years. Um, most of the people who treat a lot of this stuff have come to the conclusion that you can't do this if you don't fix your diet, you don't fix your lifestyle, you don't take your vitamins. You've got to do all that stuff. That's table stakes. But if you really want to knock the stuff out that's growing in you, you need prescription antifungals. Fluconazole, for me, it was just an amazing thing. Fluconazole is a, one of the more common antifungals. I felt so much better when I did a month of it, which is a lot. But uh, it's actually shown by uh, Dietrich Klinghart in Seattle uh, to, to very effectively modulate immune function as well when you take it um, for 50 days at a time. I didn't put the list here. I think it's actually in the newsletter. There's copies of the newsletter here. Um, it's down around some extra copies. Pretty much most of the vitamins we talk about in here show antifungal activity. Uh, and there's studies, at least 10 for each of them referenced in the book that I've got there. Things you should take, GSE, grapefruit seed extract, oregano oil, vitamin D, C, E, garlic, caprylic acid. Medium chain triglyceride oil. Anyone want to say what, what that's made out of? Cowboy can. There you go. Antifungal stuff. I feel really good when I take this stuff. 
I probably still have some fungal things. It has other things it does for your brain, the Alzheimer's effect, et cetera, et cetera. But um, one of the things this is is antifungal. That's why I brought this stuff. Um, if you want to buy it, it's a discounted price, and I'm donating 10% um, of the sale price, which means most of the profits um, to Smart Life. I just actually keep that in my garage because I take a lot of it. So I just brought it because Vern told me it wasn't going to be here. And I thought some of you might want it. If you can avoid antibiotics, avoid them, because what they'll do is they'll kill the healthy bacteria that are trying to fight off the fungus that lives in your GI tract and the rest of your body, and they can create more problems than they solve. If you have to take them because you're dying, take them. I can tell you, there's a couple of times I had sinus infections, I really wanted to take antibiotics, and I, I didn't, and I suffered for two weeks, but I got better. And this last one is a real significant thing for some people. We have this kind of arms race between bacteria and fungus in the environment. And they mutate incredibly quickly because they reproduce so fast. So the fungus makes an antibiotic called a mycotoxin. The poor little bacteria over here are like, hey, that's not cool. So what do they do? They make other toxins in response. So they're just doing the same thing that you know, we do with whoever the enemy of the day is. We throw stuff at them and they throw stuff back at us. They just do it on a much smaller level. Well, it turns out, if you have mycotoxins, you've been exposed to toxic mold, it messes with the chemistry of the stuff that lives in your nose. The, basically, you always have some bacteria that lives in your sinuses. Well, it makes them create their own toxins that will make you tired. You knock out the mold in your body and you have this, you still don't feel right. Uh, I actually had this, I had it tested, um, and I did multiple antibiotic resistant coagulase uh, negative staph or strep, I can't remember which one. So what fixes it? Um, snorting hot salt water, which by the way is a good idea if you have allergies anyway. The old yogic technique, some people use a neti pot, but the one that's proven to actually have the best immune function, I first heard about from uh, Dr. Miller, I don't know, seven years ago or something? I think, uh, weren't you recommending the, need the eye wash thing? Yep. So what you do is you put a couple drops of iodine or something similar in a bowl of water with uh, salt, maybe some good sea salt. <laughs> you bend forward into the warm water and you sniff. And the water doesn't make you choke, it goes up your nose and it comes out the little drainage things in the back of your mouth, it comes out into your mouth. Um, but when you do that, you're basically washing all of the allergenic substances and sterilizing your sinuses and you sterilize your eyes at the same time, um, which has profound effects on cold and immunity, white blood cells, all kinds of good things happen. It turns out you can do that. So for years I did that. I don't have to do it every day anymore. Clear is a saline nasal spray with xylitol in it. We've probably heard about xylitol in some of other meetings. It's the only sweetener I use on a regular basis. Uh, I also put it in my nasal uh, saline irrigator thing. And that uh, prevents bacteria from sticking in your nose. And you can add colloidal silver to that, which creates a very effective way of uh, stripping all that bad stuff out of your nose. You don't have to have the ENT surgery if you're doing this kind of stuff. Here's the hard part, this moldy food thing. We talked about all this mass-produced stuff. If they, build, if they make grain and they let it sit, it will mold. If they make corn and they dry it and let it sit, it actually already molded on the plant. And the vast majority of corn has fusarium in it, which is one of the nasty molds. Different things grow on wheat and barley and everything else. But pretty much all of the cereals have this problem. You feed them animals, it concentrates. So grass-fed meat. You can buy it at Whole Foods, although sometimes it's grain finished and they don't tell you. Um, I order mine online and I buy 50 to 100 pounds at a time. The cheap stuff comes from Slanker's Meat, S-L-A-N-K-E-R. The really good stuff, the stuff that I eat, um, the hamburger is seven bucks a pound, which isn't ridiculous, and it's better than a steak you'll buy anywhere else. Comes from alderspring.com. Like alder is a tree, A-L-D-E-R-S-P-R-I-N-G. The guy's name is Glenn, his wife is Carol. They raised their cows in uh, Idaho, and I just bought a quarter of a cow last week. They also sell just steaks and hamburger and whatnot, but that stuff tastes different than the meat you get and the stuff doesn't have mycotoxins in it. I have people come to my house, they eat meals there twice, and they go home and they start ordering stuff because it's just better, and you feel better when you eat it. You feel energized. A lot of times, me included, say, yeah, I just don't want to eat more red meat. I've got too much red meat. Red meat isn't good for you. It's not the meat. It's the mycotoxins. This is a bit of a problem. I say no eggs here. 
At the farmer's market in Mountain Dew, you can buy eggs that only live in a field and eat grass and bugs and whatever they can get. The yolks are this nice dark yellow color. It turns out, since I wrote this slide, I've come across research that looked at specifically at levels of mycotoxins in eggs. They're relatively low. I still recommend this kind of egg because they're the healthiest, but if I'm at a restaurant on a business trip and I actually go down and order breakfast, which I almost never do because I just drink protein from a protein shake in the morning in my hotel room. If I go down to have a social breakfast, I order poached eggs because those eggs don't likely have mycotoxin in them and I can get the yolks right. Cured meats, huge, huge source of mycotoxins. Sausage, bacon, that kind of stuff. Sausage and bacon have a bad reputation for causing health problems. I don't think it's because of the fat. You take grass-fed, uncured sausage and bacon, where they basically slice it and send it to you frozen, and then you cook it, it doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't taste the same either, but it doesn't have the negative health effects. Now, before this meeting, I went to Whole Foods, um, the closest one, and I bought every stick of unsalted Kerrygold butter there is. So, sorry about that. I don't like running out of butter, because I eat a stick of it every day. My HDL, I think, in my last test was 88. Which, if you track that sort of stuff, is theoretically higher than men are supposed to go. And last time I checked, I was a man. Therefore, my diet worked. <laughs> so, Kerrygold is Irish butter. And there's actually a study quoted in this book about Irish butter. In Ireland, it's expensive to get grain and cheap to get grass. Therefore, being good business people, they feed the cow's grass. And then you get butter that's relatively cheap, 269 for half a pound, and is mycotoxin free. Is it called Irish butter? Irish butter is, is grown in Ireland, and Kerry Gold is that brand. Anchor is another brand. So it's just brands of butter. You go there, there's you know, the cheapo butter, there's the earth balance stuff that has hydrogenated fat in it that they lie about and say it doesn't because it's less than a gram per serving. Um, and then there's American whatever butter, and then there's the expensive European butters. And it turns out this is one of the less expensive European butters. Trader Joe's even sells it. And how do you know that there's no mycotoxin? Um, there might be random trace amounts because there might have been something moldy on the ground and the cows ate the grass. But it's just an economic thing. In Ireland, cows eat grass because it's cheaper than grain. Here, grain is cheaper than grass, so they eat grain. It also turns out that when they eat the grass, they get much better fatty acids. Like the, it's a different product than normal butter, so it has more health effects anyway. Cured meats um, versus non-cured meats. So, do the cure by curing? Do you mean the product that include nitrates or nitrites or? So, question about curing. Um, cured meats are generally hung, and uh, in fact, a lot of pepperoni and things like that. They literally have mold growing on the outside, and it's part of the process. Unfortunately, they don't really control which molds those are very well. <laughs> um, and oftentimes, particularly with modern corn-fed meat, the animals themselves are infected with funguses, and there's at least a dozen studies referenced in here, looking at mold content of their skin, mold content of their feed, mold content of areas where horses and cows poop a lot. And bottom line is, it's in them. Uh, I can tell you, if I eat rare cooked commercial meat uh, for, that's corn fed, there's actually something infectious in some of it. I've actually twice had that happen where I'm like, oh, that looks pretty good. I'll try some of that tri tip. It's rare. And it's not that I get a response from mycotoxins, it's that for two weeks I have joint pain and I can cure it with, with uh, fluconazole. Is actually an infection, and my wife Lana gets it too sometimes. So basically, um, by curing, nitrates are not the big issue, and it turns out that, uh, as a side note to this presentation, there is uh, an interaction between having healthy gut flora and nitrates. It turns out that nitrates are much less of, an, of a health issue if you have healthy uh, probiotics growing in your gut. If your gut flora is off and you eat Nitrates, then they turn into bad stuff that bothers you. If you have the good stuff, you can actually eat nitrates and it won't hurt you. They're asking me to source that. I just remembered it. I didn't know where I found it. No corn fed products. Yikes. If you read some of the recent books about food out there, pretty much everything is made out of corn. If you go to a fast food restaurant, high fructose corn syrup, potatoes aren't made out of corn, but they're fried in corn oil if it's cheaper than lead or other oil like soy that was around. Um, pretty much the, the dairy and the cheese. The meat, it eats only corn. And they can actually measure this by the level of some certain isotope that's available. Corn is a very interesting plant. It grows quickly. Unfortunately, when it's stored, it's bad. What about organic corn chips? Organic corn chips. Well, it turns out organic stuff sometimes has more mycotoxins than non-organic stuff. <laughs> no, it's not corn chips. 
Well, it's natural, but hey, let's face it. If you go to an orange crop and you spray herbicides on it, or herbicides on it, um, which they do routinely in Florida, which I think is one of the reasons we have such nasty fungus now, because it evolves in response to threats. But if you do that, what happens? Well, you have stuff that doesn't have mold on it. You take the organic stuff that's right next door to the stuff, you know, the spores do float around, all of a sudden you get hyper-aggressive spores, uh, and they will infect the organic stuff. I don't know a study about organic corn versus not organic corn. I would only eat organic corn just the GMO problem, which is separate from what I'm talking about tonight. And I would only eat fresh, sweet corn. I wouldn't eat any dried corn, organic or not, because I know what's in it. Let's talk about the chips. So the chips, uh, are, they, right. are they dried or fresh? They're dry. <laughs> don't eat them. You know, there's a documentary, uh, Food Inc. Yes. And it, it'll tell you the story of corn. That's the book I couldn't think of. Thank you. Food Inc. is the book to read. If you want to know how much corn affects our lives, it's a great book. Well, see the documentary. It's a whole lot easier. Oh, is it easy? Yeah. Okay. Go to the video store. Food Inc. Food yeah, Inc. The pollen book talks about that. Oh, which oh, the omnivore dilemma oh, process. Right. Right. He talks about it. Uh, food Inc. Yeah, DVD. Um, yeah, rentable. Oh, library. Lowest cost option in the back. Question here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I have read the place that vitamin C is made from corn because it wasn't. Is that true? It's true that most vitamin C is made from corn. And some people with corn allergies can't take it. I haven't found vitamin C has any effect on meat as made from corn. So I believe that's probably an allergy to zine or zine, however it's pronounced. Some other thing. I don't think there's mycotoxins that make it through in vitamin C. I couldn't prove it. Uh, Two-part question. One is in the Townsend newsletter, they just recently study on children allergic to milk products and then when they put the milk in muffins and baked it at 300 degrees or higher, 75% of the kids no longer had allergies. So one question is, does the mold, can it be killed when you heat the meat, when you cook the meat and you sear it or broil it? The second question is, um, I'm having a hard time understanding, um, maybe there's something in the pathophysiology I don't quite understand, but if a cow eats moldy grain, then it's producing antibodies to the grain, to the mold. So I, the way I understood it, with people who have mold reactions, is they've got a high amount of antibodies, they get exposed to mold, and then the antibodies produce all these cytokines and they have an inflammatory reaction. So wouldn't eating beef that's been grain-fed isn't it really the ant? You're not really eating the antibodies in the beef. Like that just, just doesn't. I don't understand how a cow that eats moldy grain <coughs> has more than its meat that then is affecting you. So, so uh, there's kind of uh, two questions there and three answers. Um, so the first question that you were asking was about cooking stuff. Right. Well, if there's a mycotoxin, actually the toxin from the mold, not the mold physically present. Cooking doesn't destroy most of them in a meaningful way. Pasteurization doesn't work. Even roasting coffee beans at about 400 degrees only reduces it by about 30% if there's mold in the toxin. That's for aflatoxin. So heat doesn't destroy microtoxins. If it did, hallelujah, I'd just microwave everything and say, hell. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't work. However, in the slaughterhouses, there's lots of evidence that we have a massive problem with meat, meat-loving, meat-eating molds that grow in slaughterhouses. So you can get meat that got contaminated when the animal was butchered. In fact, it almost always happens. In that case, particularly with hamburger, you do want to make sure your meat's cooked all the way through because you can kill most molds with a reasonable amount of temperature. But killing the mold doesn't mean you got rid of the toxin. It's like botulism. You have a can that's damaged, you cook the food, you still die if you eat the botulism. Same general idea with the molds. However, you can get an infection from eating mold, from eating mold infested meat, and that's a different health problem, still a serious one than one from eating an animal that got the toxins from eating the mold. And um, I also, I really highly don't recommend cooking milk. That's like, denatured casein is just such an inflammatory, cancer-causing thing. Um, so I, I'll have to look that thing up in the Townsend letter, but I would say you should eat things as close to raw as you can. They just have to be high quality. By the way, I eat raw beef. I do it quite a bit. If it's high quality, grass fed, and I sterilize it, and it's not ground. Uh, and I feel really good when I do it. I sterilize it. Uh, I sterilize it by putting 10 drops of bugle iodine in a bowl of water and soaking the meat for three to five minutes, drying it off, putting salt and vinegar on it, and eating it. It's nice and solid. Could you blow some with vodka? Same with vodka. 
Um, I don't actually want to take that much vodka. I don't really want to drink. You want to get a little bit of alcohol, so you could soak your meat in vodka. It might taste kind of good too. You could hydrogen peroxide. You could hydrogen hydrogen peroxide. You could also ozonate it. Um, I have an ozonator I can use, but um, iodine is easy. It's good for rain. Uh, and Dr. Miller, sorry, I keep skipping around. Sorry. One of the problems that we have with corn, high fructose corn syrup, corn fed, all this stuff, it is an agricultural substance. Notice if we got rid of all the agricultural mm -hmm. subsidies, which is not going to happen, all this corn growing would stop. Right? Yep. And then all the high fructose corn stuff, all the surplus corn would go away. Right? Corn and grain are at the base of the bad health pyramid. There's just no getting around it. And mold is one of the big reasons, but it's not the only one. I mean, they're just not, we are not meant to eat those things. So if we got rid of the subsidies, mm -hmm. that would change the whole dynamic. Right? Oh, sure. Couldn't agree more. Um, let's see, uh, another question, and then I'm going to move to the rest of the slides so we can get Stan up here to answer some questions as well. So my question is more about the food. I'm going to go back a little bit. So mm -hmm. if in food, it's not the mold that's hurting you, it's the toxins that were produced by the mold. Could be both. Yeah. Okay. Then go back to the house scenario again. Um, if you kill, somehow I'm assuming mold has to have in the air, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So somehow if you kill the mole in the house, that still doesn't get rid of the toxins. That's exactly that right. Is That's that why there? if it's a house, particularly with stachybotrys, which spits out more toxins than the rest of them, and the toxins are separated from the spores there, you basically throw your stuff away, move out, throw away the clothes you're wearing. Um, <laughs> And literally, that's what they do. So even though you kill the mold, you're still not sick. Exactly. It's a poison in the environment that's made by the mold. It's not the mold itself. The allergic response thing you saw, my mold test, that was my immune response to molds. It shows I've been exposed to the molds. It turns out our immune systems don't detect mycotoxins. They're very small, very bizarre molecules, and your immune system won't detect it. You'll just get sick. But if you eat mold that has mycotoxin in it, you'll detect it which is one of the reasons that you might eat mycotoxin infect infested meat that doesn't have mold growing on it. And you, you might feel bad, but your immune system will react. So how did they get rid of the microbe? After they kill the mold, how did they get rid of the mycotoxin? The mycotoxin in what? In the house. In the house? Yeah. Um, you basically, in, in my case, they ripped out everything that, that was wet and put it in the dump wearing spacesuits. Then they scrubbed it down with wire brushes with antifungal stuff. Um, then they wet, wiped everything else down in the entire house, and they dry cleaned every piece of fabric. Yeah, but if you're using antifungals that have to do with the mold, how does that get rid of the toxin? Well, they removed every piece of thing that might have had a toxin on it. Yeah. Okay. So anything that was contaminated, they <laughs> took a saw, they cut it out, and they threw it away, and they put it in a new piece of wood. And they could tell that somehow by some kind of um, Pretty much. Okay. With oxygenization, instead of throwing all the stuff out, would that clear it out? Question about oxidation when it cleared out. Um, there are a variety of companies who make ozone, like very high high powered ozone things that will kill mold. They won't always oxidize the toxins, they don't always penetrate. And some molds are very oxidation resistant, particularly the bad ones like aspergillus niger. Um, UV is another thing. The ones that are black molds, they're black because they have melanin in them, just like us when we have a tan. They're sun resistant, they don't die easily. So there's a variety of things depending on what mold it is. Um, so it's, it, you know, these are complex things. They've been around since long before we were, and they'll be around long after we were around. So I'm going to keep going on the slides. We'll do more Q&A um, towards the end, and I'd like to get Stan up here to help answer some of these questions. We're getting close to the end. This is just pain. <laughs> Boy, chocolate and coffee. Turns out, I now drink coffee one cup every day, and I like it. I feel good. I like the taste. So what did I do? I went to a local roaster. I go to a place called uh, Red Rock in Mountain View on the corner of Castro and Little Street. And I talked to the guy with the most piercings and tattoos, because we're always the guys who know the most about coffee. Um, he's just working at the coffee shop while he becomes an artist. Uh, his name's Brendan. So he called up his roaster and they had some long conversations and we looked at various coffee processing techniques. And I also have five or six studies, um, that some of which are included in my book telling pregnant women, don't drink coffee or have caffeine, it's bad. But if you do, here's what to do about it. Bottom line is, if you buy coffee that is not cracked, doesn't have little pits and holes and cracks in it, they call that a clean roast, you can actually find coffee that has no fusarium in it. You can drink that and you feel great. So I'm to the point where I drink a cup of coffee from Pete's, I just don't feel very good. I, I, I'm not, something's not right. Sometimes I feel great, but oftentimes I don't. But if I get a really clean cup of coffee, I feel wonderful. Coffee's full of antioxidants. So coffee is bad for you? No. 
It's the Malden coffee that's bad for you, and most coffee has mold in it. I drink the Costa Rican stuff right now, the Red Rock, which has zero mycotoxins I can detect in it. I feel great when I drink it. And when I drink the one next to it, I don't. Look at the beans. If the beans are pristine, drink it. If they're not, don't drink it. If they came from a place like, that mixes a million pounds of beans from all over the place, no. My stuff is from a single estate where some guy whose name I hope is Juan Valdez um, grew the coffee. <laughs> and it's fine. This, this is the same as eating local. One guy makes it, it's probably okay. A thousand guys make it, they don't care, they mix it in a big vat and send it to you, it's probably not okay. Chocolate, same thing. Eat the expensive stuff, life is too short. When I eat bad chocolate, I get joint problems. When I eat good chocolate, I don't. So, sharpened burger used to be okay till Hershey bottom. Somehow they went down in quality. Um, if it's a single estate on it, three quarters of the time it's safe chocolate, but it's four bucks a bar. Sorry. Eat, eat the expensive stuff. Undamaged nuts stored cold. Very important. Mm -hmm. Typical business school derived process. What do you do? You take the nuts that are kind of ugly, which means they've been damaged, which means that their shells are open, which means molds can get past the skin, and you grind them up, because hey, people wouldn't have bought them anyway. You take the pretty nuts and you sell the pretty nuts whole. You take the kind of ugly but not so bad nuts, the kind of nuts you'd take home from the bar after a couple beers, but not before. Those nuts, you basically chop. So do you want to buy chopped nuts, whole nuts, or ground nuts? I buy the whole nuts, grind them yourself, it's easy. Buy a blender. <coughs> Store in the fridge, or the freezer. <coughs> um, walnuts aren't good, frozen pecans are. Also, I buy stuff at the farmer's market. Uh, I buy uh, several kinds of nuts. Look at them. Even the best people, some nuts are sh shriveled, discolored, and have a little gray color on them. Toss them. You might not taste it, but it's just not worth the risk. The black part of bananas is almost always too sorry and really bad for you. Cut out the black parts. Most of the time, if the food is moldy, you should just toss it, the whole piece, because the part of mold you see is just a little bit. They have roots called hyphae that just go way down inside. In bananas, it's usually not an issue. Cut off the part that's black. Most fermented products have bad stuff growing in them. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. There isn't usually tight control on the species and subtype of fungus that's producing these fermented products. So, if you're into yogurt, grass-fed raw yogurt, I would say do that. I don't do that. Or kefir, which doesn't make me feel good either. Apple cider vinegar doesn't seem to have problems. Um, apple cider vinegar has a ton of antifungal stuff in it. Uh, the 5% acidity helps to prevent it, and the apples themselves usually aren't moldy. Um, or I've also read that something in the process when they make it, probably the mother stuff, mother vinegar that does the fermenting, stops the other mycotoxins. That's what I use in salad dressing. Cheese is nasty. We'll talk a bit about milk. I didn't make a slide on milk, but cows eat bad stuff that goes into the milk. We know that. Now, when you take the milk and you break it into things, somewhere around 60%, or no, 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 75% of the mycotoxins go into the cheese, into the whey. Sorry, not the whey, they go into the cheese itself. As I understand it, whey usually doesn't have problems if it's from decent cows. Um, it goes into basically the casein. From there, the rest of it goes into the cream. So now you've got 25% of the mold in the cream and 75% in the skim milk that doesn't have all the stuff taken out, or most of it in the cheese. If you take the cream, that might be good enough for some people, or you turn the cream into butter and you get rid of almost all of it. So it might have 10% of the mycotoxins it had before. So if you take grass-fed butter, your chances of getting mycotoxins are very small, because even if some grass was molding or something else, the process of making the butter makes it relatively safe. No soy sauce, fermented products contains wheat. And processed foods, let's say you process it, you stick it in a wrapper, make sure it'll last for a year or two on the shelf. It's not like foods are good or bad. Foods start out on a spectrum. On one end, there's nothing wrong with them. The other end, they'll kill you if you eat them. And it's your choice. Do you want to eat a food over here or a food that's in the middle? I'll tell you, you'll feel better, you'll live longer, and you have less degenerative disease if you eat the food that's fresh and hasn't been stored for a long time. It's how it's always been, and that's how it is today, even though it's inconvenient. Don't eat grain, but some people just will because they had it beaten into them, that grain is good for them, and they obviously haven't read good calories, bad calories. But if they do read it, they wouldn't eat grains anyway. Alcohol? <coughs> bad news. Sorry, it's just not good for you. A few studies saying one glass of alcohol that doesn't have mycotoxins in it, if you can find that, which is sometimes possible, 
might have a slight benefit, mostly because that mycotoxin finds other mycotoxins. Beer and wine are the worst. Beer is worst, wine is next worst. If you must have wine, and some people do, dry white wine has the, the least amount of mycotoxins. The dessert wines have the most, and ice wine is probably the worst of all, if you've ever had that. It, that's the worst because they leave the grapes on the vine until the first freeze, which gives them time to mold, which goes into the, the wine making. Who would have thought? And this last one, I, I'm still working on my dad on this. So I've got, every time I talk to my dad about these health things, he says, yeah, I'm full or whatever. And then a couple of days later, he tries it, and eventually I've been able to migrate him over to, uh, um, you know, hopefully eating some good stuff. And he admits that. But I can't get him on the leftovers thing. He says, I like to make my food at the beginning of the week, and it's still fine four days later. It's not. It's not even fine the next day. If it's meat and you don't eat it, toss it. That's just how it works. One day after you cook it, it's been in your house, it's been exposed to air, there's spores, you can't see it the next morning, it's there. Maybe in the morning you could eat it if it's really good meat and you just can't bear to throw it out. You wait till dinner the next night, it's just not good for you. Don't do it. And sushi is your friend. Why? Because what's in sushi? Fish and rice. And you might not know this, but Whole Foods puts high fructose corn syrup in the rice. They also sell organic MSG in their organic ranch dressing, so they're slowly turning into Safeway in my opinion. But hey, they don't call it MSG, they call it spice extractive. They're organic, it's okay. Anyhow, um, there is a mercury problem with sushi. We've talked about mercury in um, these meetings before. If I eat sushi like I did tonight, I take a handful of chlorella, sodium alginate, and modified citrus pectin to absorb it in my gut, so I don't get the mercury effect. If I don't do that, then when I go to do yoga, which is the only exercise I do these days, um, I try and do something like this, and I'll fall over. But I can stand and I can do this now, even though I just had sushi, because I took my chelating agents. Did they often put uh, sugar in the rice or sushi? Some places put sugar in the rice, and or sometimes rice. they put rice wine vinegar, which is the traditional way of doing it. But rice wine vinegar is very expensive, so they usually try and use sugar and something else in there. Sushi yeah. rice always has sugar, that's part of the rest. Um, there is a, I think if you actually ask the sushi chef people, it doesn't always, but many sushi rice recipes do. The place where I go doesn't put that in there. They put in some rice wine vinegar substitute that I think is white vinegar, something, I don't know what. And would you say that uh, along the grains, would you put the oats there as well? Yes, oats have mold problems, less so than some. Um, oats also have uh, gluten in, which is very close to gluten, which is just not good for you. So if you're going to eat a grain, eat rice. Rice is probably the safest, but look at it. I went to Safeway at my place in Tahoe, and I said, oh, I'm out of the good organic rice. So I bought some Safeway rice, I opened it up, and one in 20 grains has a little black thing on the end of it. I'm like, ah, it's just whatever. Cook it, it knocks me out. It still has mold growing on it. And you look at it under a magnifying glass, it's got mold. So look at your food. If it's discolored, throw it out. Just don't eat it. It'll be better off. How about uh, freezing, like your leftovers? Well, braising your leftovers? Freezing. freezing. Oh, freezing? freezing. If you must eat leftovers, which I don't think is healthful, is healthy from an Ayurvedic perspective, your best bet is exactly that. As soon as you cook it, eat what you're going to eat, toss it in the freezer, and then defrosting it, defrost it relatively quickly, not sitting somewhere overnight, and then eat it. Could you say quickly uh, again what you use for chelating after? For chelating, I take a handful of fractured cell wall chlorella. I also take um, a, a formula made by Jarrow, Jarrow, J A R R O W. It's called Toxgard, and it's got the other ingredients that I mentioned in it. And sometimes I take the MSA if I'm feeling all aggressive. Is it time to invite Stan up? One more slide. Thank you for reminding me. Here's the cocktail. This is the last slide, or second to last slide, and then we're into questions. If you're going to eat something, that has mycotoxins, or you ate something and you don't feel good the next morning, your, your joints are stiff, you have a bad taste in your mouth, this is what to do. I actually do this every few days anyway, at least some of these. Activated charcoal, I buy it eight pounds at a time. If you buy that stuff, buy acid washed activated charcoal, it's really important. I get mine from bulk activated charcoal or buyactivatedcharcoal.com, something like that. Um, I meant to bring some, but I couldn't get small enough packages in time. I was going to bring it for people. Benzmite clay, you can buy that at Whole Foods. Um, you can all, this is, buy the stuff that's meant for eating, not the stuff you're putting on your skin. 
um, MCP is modified citrus pectin. Any soluble or insoluble fiber will help to remove mycotoxins um, from the gut. Zeolite is actually being used by some, um, some farmers right now. They put it in the cattle feed so they can feed more moldy grain. The zeolite absorbs it in the gut and expels it. I brought a whole bunch of bottles of the safest, highest quality zeolite I've been able to find, which is burden free ladder stuff. Um, it is for sale and uh, I'm donating um, this 10% uh, of the sales price, which is pretty much most of the profits, directly to Smart Life. Um, and I'll be carrying this stuff on my website for the book when I get around to that. Um, polysaccharides and uh, glucomannan is also something that will block it. Uh, interesting aloe vera has that stuff in it. And this last one, you can take beta glucan, which is well known for stimulating immune response, and it's actually made by yeast cell walls. But even though it is a yeast product, uh, it actually absorbs other mycotoxins um, because of some receptors on it. So this is, you can make a shake out of any, any volume of these things, one or more, and you can drink it. If you want to get a little bit more aggressive about removing these mycotoxins, you add cholestyramine. It's a 30-something year old prescription drug. It doesn't get absorbed in the body. It only pulls mycotoxins from the gut. It lowers cholesterol nicely. However, there is one study I know of that says charcoal lowers your cholesterol more effectively than cholesterol does. And they both bind to the bile and gut. It causes you to excrete your bile, and your bile recirculates your cholesterol. You can do a liver flush, which will get experience if you haven't done it. Um, you can Google around for liver flush. I recommend a website called curezone.com, where they have extensive discussions about this. Short version, drink Epsom salt after fasting. Then before you go to bed, you drink olive oil and grapefruit juice in relatively large quantities. Go to bed and wake up the next morning and something happens in your liver and you feel much better. Allergies tend to get better, skin clears up, stuff like that. It helps you to excrete almost everything in your bile. So all the toxins that will recirculate in your bile get excreted. What was that website? CureZone.com. C-U-R-E? Right. And last but not least, Actos is a diabetes medication. Some mycotoxins and Lyme disease and ground reflux bites and Fisteria, algae poisoning, will all cause a genetic change in your body that affects your digestive health, and Actos will turn it back. If I take Actos occasionally, and um, I actually take it pretty frequently, I notice an immediate effect of inflammation in my body because I've been exposed to so many of these things that literally they cause a genetic change. Actos flips that gene back on. Where do you get it? It's a prescription drug. Um, most people, unless you're having really serious chronic health problems, you probably don't need this stuff at the bottom. But cholesterol will bind to toxins that these other things don't. So the most effective thing I do is I take one packet of this. It's a yellow, kind of nasty tasting, orangish stuff. Uh, and I mix it with activated charcoal, bentonite, and zeolite, and I shake it in a jar and I chug it. Uh, and I feel better. It may cause constipation, in which case you're magnesium deficient. Take more magnesium. That said, this is what happens. <laughs>
text for this evening. Thank you. <clears throat> so the immune system is a very important part of the defense against uh, fungi and other um, pathogens. And one other thing, Dave, when uh, <clears throat> that killing a fungus doesn't mean it's dead, it's still a chemical that exists that's toxic. So I think that's what a mycotoxin is. Okay, let's get back to the immune system. The um, one thing I had uh, done was mercury chelation. And uh, the first one was done in uh, Carl Ednacher's office. And when I walked out of the mercury chelation, just one treatment, I fell down the steps and hit my head on a window. I said, this is really powerful stuff. I don't know what's happening. And um, I subsequently had mercury chelation by uh, Randy Baker in, um, in the Santa Cruz area. And that caused a um, tremendous reduction in mercury in the body. But a lot of it was on the loose throughout your body. And um, of course, that, a lot of it is coming from your teeth, your silver fillings. So you need a good dentist that can take out silver fillings safely, which are mercury. There he is, he's sitting up there, yeah. <laughs> and and um, the uh, silver fillings uh, cause the immune system to um, be overcome. And when the immune system is overcome, the fungus that's in your body takes over. And it can go anywhere in your body. One of the places it goes, through the bloodstream, to your brain. And uh, what happens there? Alzheimer's. We're all facing that, especially me. And um, the um, fungus is in the bloodstream, finds a uh, place to feed in the brain, in, in the bloodstream, in an artery. Macrophage. Macrophages come along to eat the fungus. And what does the fungus do? It covers itself with a protein called amyloid plaque, wow. which you've heard of for Alzheimer's. And now the macrophage cannot eat the fungus. It's inside and it's feeding on the nutrients in the bloodstream. What that does is uh, lower the energy in the brain. You begin to uh, falter, lose your memory, and you have amyloid plaque. And that disease is called Alzheimer's. And uh, I've been losing my memory 
I can tell you. But you I don't know Stan? what to do about it. Stan, can you remember? Huh? When you were losing memory, can you remember? <laughs> can I remember what? Lose your memory. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, listen to this. How can you get rid of the amyloid plaque? Curcumin dissolves it. Curcumin. Turmeric extract. Turmeric? Curcumin is the active ingredient in it. And curcumin is in uh, turmeric. So this is very important. You should be taking turmeric for the curcumin. How much? A lot. <laughs> Can I help it? I don't know. Uh, I just put it on everything. I have a powder. Turmeric goes on everything. I have capsules. I got so many capsules. <laughs> I, I, would, I would make a suggestion there. It turns out that the vast majority of spices have mold growing on them, particularly uh -huh. black pepper. The vast majority, to the point where, uh, you, I mean, it's, it's, if you look in your spice cabinet, if it's been there for more than a few months, <laughs> the odds of it having very high levels of bad things is a problem. So buy good quality turmeric. And if you're going to take the capsules, I do take them. The vast majority of brands have something called BioPure in them, which is one of the most horrible things, in my opinion, in the vitamin industry. They're saying, well, great, you look at this stuff, you take it, it increases the level of whatever this vitamin is by a large percentage in the blood, therefore it's good. Well, it's doing that because it's doing something to your liver. So this BioPure stuff, I don't think there's much that says it's safe. And if it's reducing the ability of your liver to excrete the vitamin, it's probably reducing its ability to excrete everything else. And I notice I don't feel as well when I take that stuff. So buy the curcumin extract that doesn't have biopiperine in it, which is just black pepper extract anyway. That's the one I have. It has the black pepper in it. It does. Oh. Well, it seems to be working. The life extension. Life extension. Life extension. Yeah. Most, of them so, them most of them do. I have some that's a liquid uh, critical extract. I want to say new chapter, but it could be wrong. They come in a box with a glass bottle, and they're like gel caps, but there's nothing bad in those. Gel stuff written down, Dave, or you can't rip this up off your head? Uh, it's more from the back.